Hi, welcome to Oriac Live. I'm your host, Cheryl Gushu. Today we're speaking with celebrity stylist and guru and my friend, Peter Gray. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. Hey there. How's it going? I'm good. How are you after your big long flight? Good. Really good. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it, I'm calling BS on getting used to it. I think it gets worse with time instead of better. Yeah. Well, you know, Peter, you're always traveling. You're always on the move. I know you're in Abu Dhabi right now. Um, actually, what's happening there? Are you working on something? Yep. I'm actually visiting my sister and then I'm preparing for um, a whole bunch of meetings and, you know, getting some work drummed up in this part of the world. Nice. Nice. So um, tell us about what you do. What have you been doing in the last several years? <laughs> Well, the last, <laughs> last 25, 35 years. Um, I mean, I was very lucky to get into session hairdressing. Um, it was something that I started doing. Um, I got introduced to it really with my first bar. He was in, in, did the world championships a number of times, and they all photographed the models. And straight away, I loved the photography side of it. And I was like, always oh, like, I'm, go I'm going to stop this. I'm going to go and do photography. And then I was really interested in photojournalism and I actually met Don McCullen, the war journalist, and I was like, oh, this is a fantastic world, really exciting. And then every time I went and did something, I was just like, hmm, hairdressing so much more fun. Um, and I just ended up, you know, getting into the editorial world through Greg Casley. Um, I worked at Salon and Covent Gar Coven Garden. John Burchill was there. Kind of like a whole lot of 80s and 90s people. Eugene Suleiman was there, and I actually ended up working and living with Eugene for a long period of time. Ray Allington helped me a huge amount and kind of kept me motivated, kept me going into it. He, he was really the one who got me out of doing bands and into doing more fashion-based photography. Right, absolutely. You've done so much fashion um, covers. You've worked with celebrities. You've worked with a lot of big-name models. Um, what kind of people have you worked with? Tell us a little bit about that. I think the most important thing I can give to anybody out there is that they're just people. They're just ordinary people. They're just regular people who've had in incredible tenacity um, to follow what they really believe is their course in life or their passion in life, um, whether it's acting, whether it's music, whether it's politics, whatever it is. You know, whoever I work with at that sort of, I'm very lucky they're either approaching the pinnacle or they've got to the pinnacle. Um, and it's almost more exciting before they get there because they've still got that edge. They've still got that um, that hunger. And when you get there, a lot of people, when they get there, they it's, it's a bit like an overfilled balloon. It's just so close on the verge of popping that you don't want to touch it. You don't want to go near it. And it's it's just got all that static charge around it. Um, whereas when people are sort of on their way up or people who've kind of hung on to that naivety um, and that excitement, and that's that's kind of the position and what I always personally chase is holding on to that sense of awe and holding on to that pu just pure excitement to have somebody in the chair who's prepared to let me do something interesting and creative to their hair and call it different than what everybody else is seeing. Right. So how much creative freedom would you have in those kind of circumstances? I mean, obviously, the look that you're creating is going to depend on the occasion, whether it's a magazine cover or some kind of editorial or an actual event. Um, so do they give you free reign or maybe it's a collaboration? Any center session address who says they give you free reign is nuts. <laughs> um, no, anything but. I think, you know, every step of it's a fight because people are nervous. It's, it's no different than, you know, Mrs. Jones sitting in your chair at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. It's exactly the same thing. Every human beings are terrified of change. And when they come in and they say they really want change or they want something different, you know that there's something, a huge shift in their life happening or, you know, there's a paradigm movement going on. So it's always an interesting situation kind of negotiating for that creative freedom negotiating for your vision, which may not perhaps align with theirs, or if it does align with you, theirs, then it's kind of adding that little bit of spice to it that gives them something or gives them the feeling that somebody else couldn't just produce the same thing. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously they work with you because they, they know you and they love your work and maybe they've seen your work on another celebrity and they understand your style because uh, it's a lot to do with who you are and who your style is. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's about building up trust as well. And that trust, you have to literally grab it, grab it by the ankles the first time you meet someone. There's no warm-up period. There's no dating. There's nothing. You just literally have to dive straight into that relationship and own that relationship um, because that's basically going to be your status quo. If you start off safe, it's very hard to progress. Um, I always say to stylists in the salon, I'm like, go for the biggest possible change first time because from then on, you've got somebody who's already of that psychology and they're going to bring other people to you of the same psychology, people who are looking for change, people are looking for excitement. And it really is no different than salon work. Right. Now, um, I had the opportunity of seeing you live in uh, backstage action in New York Fashion Week for Bagley Mishka. That was a beautiful show. It's always very elegant and classy. Um, tell us about that. How long have you been working with them? plate spinning and juggling at the same time um i mean backstage backstage of fashion week is always going to be a buzz um i mean you've always got oh, any between 25 and 50 girls to deal with models young models i mean you know you put 20 you know 25 to 50 model 18 to 25 year olds in a room and you know things things happen um it's it's always busy it's always hectic you're always dealing with a lot of people's insecurities, you're dealing with a lot of people's sometimes in some cases overconfidence, but you're trying to give them the confidence um, and imbue them with a the feeling that they are looking at their absolute best to represent that designer and represent themselves and walk down that catwalk and give something to the audience and then ultimately to the cameras where it's preserved for as long as those images stay around. Right. Um, and, and so when it comes to backstage, there's definitely some challenges. Um, you're under time constraints. Uh, there's a lot of hustle and bustle. It's very busy backstage. Like, how do you stay calm and manage your team and make sure everyone's on the same page and you, you put out the looks that you've intended to do? Breathing. Breathing. Any, of, any, any people who work with me will tell you, I just go breathe. I was like, you know, you do do your block breathing, four in, four out, six in, six out, eight in, eight out, whatever you have to do, just keep your breathing steady. If you focus on breathing and you breathe to your chest, not to stomach, there's something about breathing that physically stabilizes you. And I mean, this it's universal. Literally, this Navy SEALs use it for keeping calm under pressure. You know, literally when they're under assault or when they're going into an attack situation, they use it. so And it works exactly the same backstage. It's hilarious. And I always just get, you know, have to remind myself. And you'll see me backstage. I'll be like doing my box breathing and just getting it all going. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, I'll push it a little bit too far. And I get, get you know, to a point where I'm, you know, 20 in, 25 in and 25 out. And I'll get a little dizzy and giddy. And that's also great because that's a buzz for when, if you're working on stage. Um, and I always tell young stylists to do the same thing just to breathe and focus and do what you're best at and it, it, don't try and do what someone else is getting you to do try and do what you're best at you know you're best at getting that ponytail super tight get that ponytail super tight and move on and let somebody else do the bit that you're not as good at focus on that and then go in your own time and work on a mannequin i mean i still work on mannequins all the time myself practicing and building up a repertoire of ideas, concepts, and just basic techniques. So, you know, Just being able to split the head up into sections and make a ponytail, take clean sections fast and efficiently. You, know, you look at all these people online tutoring and giving classes, and you look at them taking sections, and there's a flow to it, and there's almost just this ease. And that it just comes with practice. It's really sheer practice, doing something again and again repetitively. Exactly. So, um, you know, these days, I guess we're not shooting as much. Maybe there's not as much magazine work. Um, how do you feel about what's happening editorial with magazines these days? Like, 
is that work coming back or do you think it's going away? Is it being replaced with anything? Ooh, now that really is the world of plate spinning. Um, <laughs> you know, AI is coming fast. Um, and I think, I don't think it's going to replace imagery. Um, I think it's going to replace imagery as we know it. But much like vinyl, much like CDs, I was just in Japan a couple of weeks ago, and CD shops are up and running, DVDs. Um, kids are walking around with boom boxes, kids in Starbucks. Literally, we sat down at a table. There was probably 15 or 20 people at this huge long table. At least half of them had CD drives. And they were watching music videos. They were watching movies on DVDs and CD, listening to CDs. And I was like, wow, this is a real throwback. Um, and in the same way, vinyls made its comeback and it's had its, it, you know, it was the d domain of aficionados for a while. And then it, now it's become more public and more cult. And people collect it for the album sleeves. Um, they collect it for the warmth of the sound that comes out of an LP that you can't really reproduce digitally. And I think there will always be that space. There's a huge kickback in the industry, fashion industry, especially now, and music industry where people are shooting film, like shooting old stock film and shooting Polaroid. Um, and people are getting 35 mil film, film stock, motion film stock and rolling it onto the little uh, spools. Right, so you're seeing sort of a resurgence of uh, old school style uh, creativity. Definitely, cre the create old school style creativity, but clashing with the AI. So, you know, I was talking to a photographer the other day and we were out shooting and he was like, you know, I was talking to him about Mid Journey, which is um, an AI program that's on Adobe at the moment. And it's so interesting watching what can be generated and how to augment your own images and how to augment, you know, what we do as creatives in the camera. Hair, luckily for us uh, hairdressers out there, hair is, I think, going to be the last bastion of perfection in AI. Um, I think hair is tough. It's like retouching hair. Retouching hair was always extreme and still is extremely tough to make good, not to make it look that plastic or that perfect. And I, I think any good photographer will tell you how difficult it is to retouch hair and how important quality hair is to the image. Skin has always been a little bit easier as long as it's not too powdery or too clumpy or they haven't, people haven't tried to cover too much in one spot. It's been it's easier to smooth over. Clothing, however, is, I think, the big paradigm shift. I, was, I had a meeting with a friend, Keenan Dufty, who's a designer and is now... Parson, um, the dean of, he was at Parsons as a lecturer and then a professor, and now he's dean of Marangoni Institute in Miami. And we were talking about, you know, the young fashion designers and how much they're using AI to create interesting, exciting new fashion design. Yeah, well, you know, like us who are pretty old school and we started back in the days of film, you really learn to hone your craft and and 100% understand and have the skill to do this because we didn't have posts back then. We didn't have editing. You know, we, we were just whatever was on set, what you see is what you get. So, um, so what you're saying is there's a little bit of a combo of the two. Um, so, and, and how are the magazines doing these days? Like, are you shooting magazines still, or is there a lot less of that? I mean, we're shooting, but obviously, you know, the magazines are a business, you know, it's like the film companies, they're a business, you know, they're all, everybody's on strike at the moment because it's a business disagreement. It boils down to a business disagreement between the powers that be and the people who are providing the creative input. Um, and magazines are no different. They're consolidating. Um, we're shooting more and more um, content that's utilized on multiple platforms, not just social platforms, not uh, but multiple magazines. So if you'll do, you do one Vogue, that imagery is used in multiple Vogue. So you can almost overshoot on every shoot we do. So instead of you know doing six to eight pages, we'll go and shoot 18 to 20 pages. Um, because you know that they're going to be mixed up and mashed up and spread out across many different versions, different countries, different cities. Um, 
of that of that in each individual magazine. And I don't think, you know, Hearst and Condé Nast are both doing exactly the same thing and they're the two pretty much the leaders. There's a huge number of independent magazines that are coming up at the moment. Um, it's just making things very exciting. You know, I feel like the, the, the independents are kind of this vanguard of change and they're fighting the evolution but leading it at the same time. Right. Well, that's good to hear because I'm a big magazine fan, obviously. I love a good tangible magazine. And anyone who has their work in a magazine loves to see it in the pages or on the covers. I mean, you've done so many covers. Um, you've worked with, with pretty much all the majors. Um, so what's it like being a freelance artist? You're, you, you haven't really worked for a company. You've just been your, your freelance work most of your career, right? So I've been freelance, but as a freelancer, editorial doesn't pay the bills. Um, I think at its peak, I think Vogue paid $175 a day. I mean, that's pretty much gone now. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I don't know anybody who really is getting paid for editorial right now. So, you know, everybody consults. And through my career, I've consulted for whew, any number of different companies, you know, from Product, product companies, tool companies, brush companies. Um, through the years, I've oh God, at least 15, 20, 25 different companies over the years. Mm -hmm. um, some major, some minor. Um, some more successfully than others. And again, it's like anything creative. It boils down to your communication, how, you, how your relationship develops. Um, I think it's it's very interesting creatively working with people. People always ask, you know, like, who are your favorites? Who are the standouts? Um, it's an interesting question because everybody is a, is a favorite because every, every day I go to work, that person has to be my favorite. That person has to be my absolute focus. And I think that's the difference that salon hairdressers see that we have. You know, we have got that constant level of new and enthusiasm because each day you've got this renewed vigor and each day is fresh and new. Um, so you can't really single out an individual. I can't really single out and say, you know, this actress was my favorite. I can say I've had incredible shoots with b various bands over the years. I mean, I had, I, I toured and shot with and worked with a band called Oasis for about at least 10 years. Oh, yeah. And so I had some fantastic shoots and some shoots where I did everything but the hair and the hair was completely secondary. You know, I was like, look, the hair looks fine. You know, and they were like, are you sure? It looks a bit messy. It looks a bit, and I was just like, just leave it. And having the trust from people like that is what makes you, makes them a favorite because it in, empowers you to do something more. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you brought up a point there. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. You, you just brought up a point that um, I'm thinking about when you said messy. You know, sometimes hairdresser, hairdressers can take it a little too far and try and perfect everything too much, but sometimes a shoot or a show or whatever look you're creating doesn't require perfection, and sometimes perfection is imperfection. Right, and I, I think you do imperfection very well, but it's it's calculated imperfection. If I'm if I'm right, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, that I was very lucky to learn from an actor, a theatre actor, very early in my career, um, and it was like it doesn't matter what's on the stage. What you do on the stage is what the audience sees as correct. If the line isn't delivered in exactly the right way, verbatim, according to the script, the audience doesn't actually know. If you deliver it with conviction and you deliver it with enough vigor and enough self-belief, then they'll accept it as truth. Mm -hmm. And I confidence think the same goes for such care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, confidence is, is such a big key part of you know, being in charge and, and being in that chair and having control of your creative direction and exactly what you're doing. Uh, I think it's very important. Um, so, you know, you're always on the move and on the go. How do you keep track of your crazy schedule? I, I, think you're, I know you have an agency. Like, how does that work for you? 
Um, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I, I lie. I thrive on chaos. Um, this is not someone, something, this is not a job for people who need order. This is not a job for people who like to plan ahead. Um, you know, I've missed, you know, funerals, weddings, bar mitzvahs, the last, because I've been working. Um, you know, you make it work around your schedule um, you, and the schedule dictates and you hope that people are, and you end up collaborating with people who are amenable to that schedule. I mean, this interview, we shifted it from yesterday because yesterday I was traveling for 18 hours and we actually ended up arriving an hour and a half late last night in Dubai. We went via Paris um, to Dubai from New York and ended up an hour and a half late this morning. Then getting the, tra the getting here to Abu Dhabi was late. And I think, you know, finding people who will accommodate that is the people who you end up collaborating with. Um, finding people who will understand that you can't just cut their hair tomorrow. It just doesn't work that way. You know, so the, the, the few private haircuts that I still do are people who are really addicts. They love the haircut and they feel like they can't get the same haircut anywhere else. And as a hairdresser, there's no better feeling than having someone who's that loyal to you and i really appreciate that and i don't think salon hairdressers appreciate it enough because having somebody who's prepared to flex their time and flex their schedule in order to to uh, to be you know accommodated by you i find that really exciting still you know i'm 35 years in and i still get a huge buzz off that it makes me really feel like really excited when somebody's prepared to wait for a haircut and Sometimes they're waiting a month, you know, six weeks. For sure. You know. Well, you know, you're you're you are the celebrity, and that's part of the <laughs> part of the, the So that, I'd like to dispel that myth. You need to work around you, the celebrity. Um, so I, I know you teach a lot. You do lots of education. I, I've witnessed uh, one of your classes, and um, I have to say your luggage looks like something out of home depot it's uh <laughs> it's very interesting the type of tools and uh items that you have in your luggage um how like it, it's about creating things that are very unique and different and you're you're always educating uh how important is education for any stylist in the industry 100 percent. education is everything I think educating yourself in every aspect. Um, you know, I consult for a company, a lady that has 150 salons in Seoul, Korea, called Juno. And she insists that every member of her staff reads the same book every month. Every month they re read a book each and then they meet up and discuss that book. And every month, every member of her staff reads a, the, a book that's been allocated. And, you know, sometimes it's fiction, sometimes it's, it's, you know, get ahead in business or, you know, business advice or, um, but I think education is just everything. I think what we talk to clients about, if you talk garbage to clients, you're going to attack, attract that kind of client. If you want to discuss politics with clients, be appraised of what's going on in the world of politics, be appraised on multiple levels. Don't just watch, you know, whatever is on TV. Um, you know, I think that's so important for me. You know, I do a number of very powerful businessmen and political people, and I find it fascinating where they get their news from. And I'm always like, you know, do you mind if I have a look over your shoulder at the iPad? Because, you know, you're gunning on the iPad and you've got interesting news there. And to me, that's education, not just the physical education. Aside from that, the hair education is very important. Um Creatively, you know, you talk about Home Depot. Every time I see a hardware store, a craft store, um, a sub creative supply stores, I love any junky creative supply stores. I love secondhand stores. Just looking around for bits and pieces. I did a shoot at the beach in North Fork, North Fork two or three days ago with an actress, Kat Graham. And I arrived with almost no equipment, but a huge bag of fabric. And we ended up putting bits of fabric over her head. And I had, uh, oh God, I think it was about 10 or 12 meters of this sheer black fabric. And I'd got it from a reference of her Brits in uh, shooting a woman in the desert. 
and we were sort of had her on in the water and we were wrapping it around her head and letting it billow in the wind and she was like you really brought fabric and and I was like yeah but your hair looks fantastic as it is it really I literally used water um, from a water spray and a tiny bit of oil and put a tiny bit of oil in the hair first and put water over the top of that just so to get that damp sort of lived in beachy hair rather than using a salt spray or anything typical that you would expect to use at the beach and it just gave me this soft tenderly hair but then all this bag of different fabrics gave me so many different images and it meant that the photographer was really excited to work with me I'd never worked with him and Kat was just like oh he's doing as usual he's you know brought his box of tricks and sometimes it's Home Depot and it's <laughs> bits of steel Meccano I love kids toys um you know I love yeah, Meccano. It's interesting. I, for, you, for you to take that perspective um I, I guess in a way it's kind of a, an avant-garde uh, perspective on hair too when you're you're pulling bits and pieces of things you find around the house or or the dollar store or Home Depot or whatever that is but um, really like you said earlier it's about it's about playing around and and continuing to educate yourself in a way whether it's just playing with things and playing with the hair like you, you find that very important right constantly constantly mm -hmm. I, I would I very rarely watch TV shows or and or movies I'll watch and generally I'll watch them on recommendation. Um, you know I don't just I won't just troll and find a movie to watch. Like I'll watch something that somebody who whose opinion I respect recommends to me. You know I won't just go. You know I can't go to Netflix. Yeah, I don't subscribe to Netflix, but I can't sit on. I use Amazon mostly because I have Amazon Prime from all the deliveries, all you know, the little bits and pieces, the hat pins that I love. And I just ordered a whole bunch of hat pins for a show we did in Shanghai, and they were inter really interesting to work with. And at the same time, I was looking at they had some a new glue gun, for example. That you know, I love glue guns. Um, because yeah, you can that would be for materials not the hair right <laughs> well you can glue you can glue hair as a material to clips to grips to to pins to shafts to bits of plastic and you can then bend those bits of plastic or bits of fabric into different shapes with the hair kind of adhered to them so you're not just looking at hair as a conventional material applied in a conventional way which will give me a conventional aesthetic i'm always looking for something outside of the norm and it's like you said going back to allowing accidents to happen is very very important and i you know i always say don't overthink it i spent 15 years teaching at sassoon's and i think that was it's kind of a sassoon's teaches you to learn the basics and then they say break the rules but you never really get to break the rules because it's you're working within such a strict technical framework and I think really breaking the rules has, for the last 15 years has been my reaction to being sort of at Sassoon's and so put in that pen where you have to use your scissors in a certain way. And unless you produce a technical haircut of a certain quality, it, w didn't, it wasn't considered good. Right. So, yeah. well, that was a different, different philosophy and a different way of teaching. Um, and not that either one is, is right or wrong, but uh, I find it interesting because that made you want to break through that, that perfection, follow the rules uh, model. Um, you know, sometimes the best designs are design mistakes and things happen yeah. by accident that the turn glitches. out fabulous. <laughs> I love the glitches. You know, any sort of glitch that happens, I learn so much from young assistants, you know, when they use the wrong product or they use a product in a different way than you're meant to or you know they just grab a tube and put a, put too much in the hair and i'm like okay don't panic don't panic let's start working with this and instead of just rinsing it out let's see what the results can be wh what we can do with hair right. um, and i think being flexible and being it's about adapting your psychology and about going okay you know what and i i don't freak out if the plane's Five hours late, I, I don't freak out. I just sit in the airport and I'll tune out. I'll listen to an audible book or I've got my little black book, which, you know, I pretty much carry everywhere with me in my bag and a pen, old Milk Studios pen, my favorites. And, you know, I'll sit there and I'll just write down random ideas. So if I'm listening to an audible book, I'll 
pick up like what I see as a piece of wisdom or a piece of philosophy from someone else and try and steal it and mold it into something I can use personally. Mm -hmm. That's great. It sounds like you really keep your stress level down based on your really crazy schedule. Like it's very important to find ways to, to breathe and to um, stay calm and be inspired and just, and just be able to move forward in a, in a calm fashion. I think, you know, it's, it's like anything. It's, you you don't learn how to sail a you know how to sail a boat if you're sailing on calm seas you learn how to sail a boat when you're in the storm and i think for me having the education and the techniques having a huge repertoire of techniques is which i'm still adding to and i've you know i've hopefully got another you know 10 or 20 years to add to that repertoire and continue to add to that repertoire and i'm always adding and kind of so excited in my team blessed with an amazing team. Mm -hmm. So uh, what advice would you give to someone who's starting out in the business? Find a mentor and really commit, really commit. Realize that it's going to take what everybody else isn't prepared to do. Um, to give you the edge, you have to be able to commit and do what other people aren't prepared to do. And that means you've got to be prepared to work Sunday and Monday. You've got to be prepared to give up your personal time, what you see as your personal time. You've got to be prepared to sacrifice those times with loved ones, with partners, with friends, that, uh, you know, weddings, funerals, bummits, as I always say, like I miss so many, I, you know, if I do, if I go to a wedding, it's because I'm doing the hair. Um, you know, friends' weddings definitely are not a priority because they take up time and they generally mean you're going somewhere where you just don't have time. If you're going to commit to shooting, you can't let somebody else shoot with your photographers because if you do, you're going to, you know, the people you've built up that relationship with, you, the moment you leave that gap open, they have an opportunity to start another relationship. Right, for sure. Um, and I understand from shooting too is um, that the photographer is, is really the director and kind of the collaborator of the core group of people that usually work together. So it's really important to establish a great relationship with, I guess, as many photographers as you can. I mean, ultimately, yeah, for me, I view the photographer as the visionary. And then I'm there to augment that vision. I'm there to enhance that vision. I'm there to collaborate. And sometimes it's just about getting the subject into the you know, mood or the psychology where they feel they can fulfill that vision. That, that's very exciting for me rather than it's – I think a lot of people think of hairdressing on set being about your vision and realizing your vision. I think it's the abject loss of ego rather than – putting your ego forward in any way, shape, or form. You have to totally sublimate your ego and be there in order to realize somebody else's vision. But in realizing somebody else's vision, you actually grow yourself and you grow trust. You create a repertoire. And again, I've been incredibly lucky. I mean, you know, I, I just, you know, and people will go, oh, the harder you work, the luckier you become. And yes, that's true to some, some point, but... I've also been just sheer damn lucky on so many counts of working with like incredible photographers and incredible directors and incredible DPs and incredible musicians and models, you know, the repertoire models and actresses that I've been able to work with. I just, I just, you know, I'm still, I still look at it and I'm like, wow, I want to pinch myself every day and every job that comes up. I'm so excited to be there and so excited to still be hanging in there and going like, wow, I, I'm still relevant. Wow. This is exciting. I'm, I'm going to push it even harder today. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you for such a, a long and fantastic career. Uh, and, and that it's, it's still rolling and going strong. I, I love to hear that. Um, I, I want a, a little bit of nostalgia. Guess what I have. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I do that, Tessa? Yeah, Peter did this beautiful cover, this beautiful shoot, and it's still one of my favorites. And I swear I would I would hang it up. She's an incredible wall. model, though. Yeah, and so it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous shoot that I just love. I remember the shoot so clearly. Lucky. This is when I first met Peter doing this this amazing, amazing shoot together. So I I, uh, I really appreciate your work, and I saw it live right from the get go. And uh, you're just an inspiration and, and amazing to work with. So I just wanted to say thank you, and I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Um, I'd like to. Uh, can you tell us where we're going to find you, um, and uh, you know what what's coming up next, and where can we find you? Okay, well, I'm shockingly bad at Instagram and Facebook. Um, I do reply to DMs. Um, as long as you notify me, that, you know, on a DM that you don't just go to hidden or something like that, because those I can't keep up with. Um, email, I'm absolutely awful with. Um, and the phone is always oh, good. So, to have my people call your people. <laughs> so. Yeah, basically. I mean, I, you know, my, my agent is there really for, you know, my agent works with me on Google Calendar and we share a calendar and we, t we text and chat and, you know, more it's about letting off steam and chatting and, you know, just logistical planning. Um, that's home agency in New York. Uh, you know, they collate and organize my all my imagery that comes in that I do and that comes out um they don't do a lot of st the stuff uh, I do on the side like noise the noise shows that I do with Richard Ashworth mm -hmm. um that we travel all over the world for and we've just started up again since COVID we just came back from Shanghai had a fab fantastic show there um so noise is always one to look out for nice. um apart from that Peter Gray hair on Instagram um, like I said, I am terrible at it. It's just I'm of a different generation. I get and my attention span is I get lost in looking at other people's creative output, not anything but hair most of the time. My team will tell you, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning when I'm jet lagged and can't sleep, I'm pinging them. You know, look at this circus act. Look at that. Oh my God! Look at this person's, you know, painting on a bit of fabric and then. <laughs> setting it on fire this is amazing wouldn't this make a cool show <laughs> yeah well, you're always you're always researching for inspiration and it, it never stops and and we we get it from you too so we really appreciate it that's the flow of energy isn't it as, lo as much as you put out is what you get back absolutely absolutely well once again thank you so much peter for joining us it was so great to connect with you and uh we wish you all the best, and we look forward to everything you're about to do. Thanks so much to you and to Oriac for putting this out there. Keep on pushing the industry forward. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers.